Thank you, Colonel. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today. It would have been a greater pleasure had I gotten some sleep, but it seems that I've gotten all the cumulative uh, revenge of Australian uh, colleagues that when they're going out to Europe, they complain about their jet lag and they all pass it to me. It is also a challenge to be here today, not because of the sleep question, but uh, because of two things I heard uh, yesterday. One is I noticed from uh, the intervention of my friend Paul Morris, who were together in Washington when I was stationed there, that EC stands for emergency circumstances. It used to stand for something else uh, in Brussels in the past. And also TK Fullerton made uh, more of a joke than what could have been otherwise in the past. They love to hate of Europe. Well, let me you know, make clear my objective here, which is not to make you love to love us, but at least to try to better understand where we're coming from and where we're going in terms of the future of the common agricultural policy. And how do I intend to try to do that? Well, first of all, I will try to focus briefly about the objectives of the next uh, CAP reform, the content of uh, the reform process, take a look at the state of play of the common agricultural policy today, the policy challenges and options we will have to face, and the next steps in this reform process. And starting with uh, the objectives uh, and the future challenges, these are coming from a public consultation process that uh, took some time, but resulted in something that is a bit unique in the history of the CAP reform process of the last 10, 15 years. There seems to be a broad agreement about the future challenges including one that is very much related to the title of the first part of the title of this session, food security. One would wonder what is a developed part of the world like the European Union have to be afraid of in terms of food security. It's clearly not the same type of concerns that one has in developing countries. It's mainly driven by the extreme price volatility and the impact of the economic crisis in European agriculture, for which I'm going to come a little bit later. The second area of challenges concerns environmental challenges, whether it is climate change, where the debate in Europe is not whether we're going to have it, but what we have to do to mitigate its impacts and adapt. It's issues related to soil, water, air quality, habitats, and biodiversity. And finally, the need to have a to focus on the territorial balance uh, challenges. And this type of concerns stem from a couple of analyses that we have assigned externally, uh, called um, under the Senar 2020. They were looking at what would happen to European agriculture by 2020 under various scenarios. In, in the no policy scenario, the outcome is not so much uh, on production. Of course, there are going to be some sectors that would be affected, but overall, the European Union will continue to produce agricultural products. It's going to be mainly on where this production is going to be concentrated. And it's going to be much more in intensive in the most competitive regions with more pressure on the environment, and we will also face land abandonment. So if you want, the impact of the existence of the cap is more environmental or territorial balance. Now, all this fits into what were the derived objectives of this debate for the future reform, which is viable food production, that is retain our production capacity, which does not mean provide incentives for people to produce, but mainly provide incentives that guarantee that what they produce is sustainable, which comes to the second overall objective, the sustainability management, the sustainable management of natural resources, and third, the balanced territorial development. All these have an overarching debate about more equity and balance of support among member states and among farmers. And I will come back later to that because this is one of the biggest challenges of the next reform. And it all fits together well into the overall uh, Europe 2020 strategy, a strategy that is described by three uh, terms of growth, smart, sustainable, and inclusive. Now, if you try to put all the cap reform into a wider uh, context, there are three uh, broad areas of challenges that characterize it. First of all, we're facing 
what we consider, based on our analysis, to be a cost-driven commodity price boom. I'm going to focus a little bit more on that uh, immediately afterwards. When we try to do our baseline, our medium-term outlook, it's a bit longer than what we used to do going to 2020, to assess the potential impacts of uh, various policy scenarios, um, this baseline is characterized of major uncertainties in terms of demand growth, in terms of supply growth, mainly we see most of the constraints coming from a slowdown in productivity growth in Europe and in the rest of the world. Uncertainties concerning the macroeconomic environment, the impact of climate change, which is very localized and regionalized, and also issues related to the wider link of agriculture with energy. There are two other areas that are important but are mainly internal within the EU. The first one is that with a change in our treaties, with the Lisbon Treaty, the European Parliament has co-decision powers in agriculture. In the past, it only provided its opinion and it was the Council of Ministers that decided. This does not only make the process of decision longer, it also makes it more complex in the context of 27 member states. And finally, there are parallel decisions that have to be taken that will affect the future of the CAP, including the big unknown of the next uh, community budget, which, like all budgets, is under uh, pressure, and the, the manner by which we would fit into the wider EU 2020 strategy. Let me focus here most on the, the first of these areas, which is the commodity-driven price boom. I mean, in this graph, you don't see anything that you haven't seen before. This is the evolution of the World Bank real price indices for all the major commodity groups since 1960. What is different recently than in the past is this is the first time that we have a parallel commodity boom and bust in all the major uh, commodity groups. And what is also interesting is that the increase in prices in fertilizers, metals and minerals, in, in energy is much bigger than what is happening in agriculture. In fact, if you look at a more recent period and start in 1986 up until 2003 and take the average of the evolution of agricultural prices, which has been rather steady in this period, and the average in the most recent period, which is anything but steady, and compare it with what had happened in energy over the same period, you see that the growth of energy prices is more than four times greater than what has happened in agriculture. If you do the same exercise for fertilizers or for metals and minerals, you will see that there are, uh, the price increase is roughly 150%. So however significant there has been, the increase in agricultural prices, it's much lower than what has happened in other sectors. Inside the EU, we have seen similar developments in the food chain that made the picture more complex. With the green, you have the evolution of agricultural prices uh, that reached a peak by uh, January, February 2008. Then they started decreasing all the way to the summer of 2009, and they started going upwards again. Uh, the, the food producer prices, the processors, came in with a certain lag, and when prices of agricultural producers started declining, they never declined that much. You see a much more steady path in the retail service, and you see some impact in the overall rate of inflation. Uh, let me be clear, we do not expect that every 1% increase in agricultural prices should imply a similar increase across the food chain. But it's also clear that there is a significant degree of asymmetry in the transmission of price changes, and especially when prices or agricultural producers tend to go down, something seems to be forgotten along the food chain. And that has generated major concerns about the transparency of the food chain system and also the need to try to do something that would increase the bargaining power of producers, which is as an objective uh, something that is generally agreed. Uh, widely, but it's extremely difficult to find ways of implementing it. Finally, the last graph that shows what we mean by a cost-driven commodity price boom that looks into the evolution of the index of uh, real uh, prices 
within the EU, the output prices of agricultural products and the parallel uh, evolution over the same period of input prices. The downward trend in real terms of agricultural prices is not something new. It has stabilized in recent years, but not as much in uh, Europe as elsewhere because these prices are expressed in euros, so they also reflect the appreciation of the euro or the dollar over the same period. What is new is what started happening after 2005-2006. It's you have a much stronger increase in input prices, which are basically today at the level they were back 15 years ago, while our output prices are uh, about 25% uh, lower. And that generates a double squeeze on farm income and makes very difficult their adjustment to the new situation. I'll come back a little bit later to that. Now, let me focus a little bit on where we are and where we have gone with the CAP reform. Uh, some of you must have seen this graph every year. We tend to add one column. I first presented this graph in Washington uh, back in 1999, and you see the process of CAP reform since there. With the red, you have the most trade distorting element of our policies, which is export subsidies with amber intervention, uh, market intervention, with blue, what used to be coupled support with limitations on area and the number of animals. That was the reform of Maxari starting in the mid-90s. Then the Fisler reform uh, with decoupled supports in the green, and also the increase in the money that we spent in rural development. This is expressed in real, uh, in 2007, constant prices. And what it shows is that we have a in real terms, stability in our budget, while at the same time the European Union grew from 12 member states back in the Maxari reform to 27 member states uh, today. On the right-hand side, you see the share of the cap in the total EU GDP. Why do we use the GDP as an indicator? Because the cap is one of the very few policies that are, is centrally financed by the community budget. Uh, over the same period, so public expenditure in Europe has hovered ar around 48% and has been rather stable and increasing in recent years. So there has been, in parallel to a reform, a contribution of a, a decline in the share of uh, the cap to the overall public expenditure in the EU. This has had a clear market impact. What you have in amber is the average uh, production surplus in the EU before the reform process, the average of 90 to 94. And with blue, you have the same average for 2005, 2009. Two products come out immediately uh, to notice. One is beef. We used to be the largest exporter in the world. Now we are one of the largest importers. And sugar, where we have turned with a recent reform into a slight net importer that will get bigger as the years pass. There are uh, some declines in other uh, areas, but there is no indication that we're going to run out of food or stop being an exporter of uh, agricultural products. Most of our exports are value-added uh, products, and we might have a record uh, year this year. Uh, it's not clear yet how much of this is price-driven and how much is quantity-driven. And we're also the largest agricultural importer in the world, mainly importing from developing countries. Uh, very briefly, a graph that would show how irrelevant for the debate right now is the level of support prices in the EU. With green, you have the evolution of our intervention price. With uh, red, our internal market price. And with blue, with blue a, a relative wool market price per product. And you see that what is driving, at least in the wheat, our markets is what is happening in, in uh, the world. Uh, if you look uh, at the same graph in uh, skim milk powder, this is a graph that I presented last time and that I was here in the ABAR conference when our prices were going down, they're going up again. It took us longer to reform the dairy sector than it took us to reform the cereal sector, but we are moving uh, gradually there into a situation where we are price takers in every single product and commodity in world markets right now. 